Wales is a beautiful country, but it's also a dark land. In this series, we join retired Chief Constable Jackie Roberts as she revisits some of the country's most notorious murders. OK, good morning, team. Nice to see you all. She is assisted by a team of leading experts. Together, they will apply modern policing techniques to examine a series of disturbing murder cases. These include cold cases, the reinvestigation of which may lead to the identification of a prime suspect and solved cases that are considered landmark police investigations that continue to impact on the way murder is detected in the UK today. The usually bustling rifleman's arms where the two men drank every night and where they were last seen alive is hushed. The streets are deserted and people peer from behind curtains in an area where doors were once left open. Easter Monday, 1972, was the last time that anyone saw two Blynavon men, Isaac, IQs and Arthur Waite, alive. Their bodies were discovered in a house in the town two days later. They had been bludgeoned to death in a frenzied attack. Over at the incident room in the citadel of the old Swansea Library, the Darkland team have gathered to reinvestigate this half-century-old murder mystery. So Paul will be looking at the case of a double murder, Isaac Hughes and Arthur Waite, that happened in 1972 in Blynavon. It's something of a 50-year-old mystery, this particular case. It's in quite an isolated village at the top of the Gwent Valley. It's Easter Monday and most of the locals are in the local pub there. And in the pub with, with all the locals, are two people, uh, Ike or Isaac Hughes and James Arthur Waite. They're in the pub literally from two o'clock in the afternoon until 11 o'clock in the evening, certainly consuming a huge amount of alcohol. They're assisted from the pub by a couple of the locals. Ike is left in the house with Arthur about 11.30 that evening and uh, that's the last time they were actually seen alive. On the Wednesday, the police are called and the bodies of Ike and Arthur are found in the living room of the house, both men are deceased and an investigation is started. So today we're joined by Mark Waters, a retired head of CID of Gwent. Mark, you'll have more knowledge than the rest of us in relation to the detail of this case because you were a young Bobby at the time of the incident and had some involvement in the case. So what would you hope to achieve um, from re-looking at this now today? We would clearly like to know who actually killed Isaac and Arthur. I think the people who would have them would like to know, and certainly policemen serving at that time would like to know what exactly happened. A now retired detective who worked alongside Mark Waters in 1972 was Derek O'Connell. He has agreed to share his memories of the investigation for the first time. However, he has requested that the interview be audio only. I uh, came to Blenavon in 1967 as a young uniform officer on the beat and I worked here on the beat until uh, 1970 when I was appointed onto the CID. I was the detective in station in Blenheim. In my time, I dealt with five murders and uh, nothing like this had taken place. They were all basically family oriented, but this was out of the ordinary, very much so. Paul Bethel and forensic psychologist Paul Britton have traveled to Blenheim. They begin at the place where the events began to unfold on that fateful night. So Paul, we're here now, this is the Rifleman's Arms, the public house where we know that Ike and uh, Arthur spent uh, virtually all day from about two in the afternoon to 11 o'clock in the evening drinking. So this would be a, a very, very important uh, location from the point of view of the investigation. Who's in there? The bar staff, the customers, any strangers. Is it the usual bar staff or is it a different crew because it's a bank holiday. Yes. What's the atmosphere? How is it compared with their usual place? And is it the only pub in the village? Yeah, but certainly in relation to Arthur and Ike, we need to know what exactly was going on with th those two. Were they jolly? Were they happy? Were they argumentative? Yes, because this is what we would call scene one. This is where it seems to all start. Yes. Although we're not 100% sure, something could have happened earlier. 
So lots of interesting questions now about the, the house itself, the murder scene. Shall we go and have a look at it and have I a chat? I think we should. The house where the murder took place was the home of Isaac Hughes. It was located at Rifle Green, a short walk from the pub where he and Arthur had spent their Easter Monday. Following the murder, the house fell into disrepair as no one would live there. Demolished some years later, the gap that remains is a constant reminder to the community of what happened all those years ago. So Paul, we're here at the location where Ike and Arthur were killed. Yes. From what we can gather, it was best described as a, as a one up, one down, these small, almost like a flatlet uh, type of premises. And uh, at about 11.30 on the Easter Monday evening, the, the friends leave them in the house and, and they're left as far as we know in the sitting room of the house. And that tells us just a little bit, doesn't it, about the people. Because rather than being just a short step across a road, there's a little investment of effort, isn't there? So you're looking at someone who either particularly wanted to bring them home, had some reason, or something that indicated friendship, something that indicated powers, that you were not going to just leave them there. So that helps us to formulate little hypotheses about what we need to know more about. What we need to know, what we need to dig really deep into here is what are the lives of Ike and Arthur about? I think the motivation is a key issue. We want to know more about these two men and the environment that they lived in. We want to know about their work history, everything that we can that allows us to say, I think we ought to be looking in this direction. I knew Ike. I didn't have a lot to do with Arthur, but on two occasions, as a uniform officer, on a night shift, I actually picked Ike up um, in a drunken stupor and took him up to a caravan where he lived on his small old inn. That was about the only dealings I had with him. Many family members of the murdered men still live in Blynavon, and despite the passage of time, they are still searching for answers. Paul Britton has arranged to meet Darrell Waite, the great nephew of Arthur. Darrell, when did you first become aware of the killings that are associated with your family? When I was a little boy, I was around six or seven. My father told me what had happened. What did he tell you? I was curious about the gap that was in the houses down the road here. That's when he told me that's where your uncle Arthur got murdered. Him and his friend, and they couldn't sell the house that the, it was built on because it was so horrific. How did you as a family deal with that? I mean, I was very young. I, I wasn't even born when, when Arthur got murdered. It obviously had a, a, had a big effect on my father because he, he'd bring it up every, every so often and I, all through the course of my life. How would he bring it up? Out of the blue sometimes, close to maybe birthday. Ah, oh, yes. And it would and maybe play on his mind. He, he've always said that he wanted the case reopened. There must have been all sorts of suggestions about what lay behind these killings. As with any small place, you're going to get rumours, you're going to get truths, but dividing the two is a very difficult thing to do. My father had views and opinions on who he thought, but thought and proving are two different things, isn't they? There are a variety of potential motives, reasons that sit behind it. May I ask you what you've been made aware of? My father made me aware of the fact that Arthur was a, was a bit of a fly, a bit of a fly by night and I think he may have been speaking to people that you shouldn't have been speaking to on a married sort of basis. Oh, if yes. I mean. So perhaps talking to someone else's wife? Talking, putting it politely. I, I understand so. what you're saying. <laughs> We're being gentle, aren't we? Mm. What might that have led to? Well, I think if somebody found out that their wife was cheating with another man, then it induces anger, doesn't it? Especially if you're a person that's known for being angry, then sometimes that anger alcohol induced can, can become more than anger. Even though this is a small village town, this case, these killings, are still almost very much alive and people are affected by them across the whole place. It leaves a scar. I think it's something that you just, over time, push back to the back of your mind. Because obviously there's never been no conclusion and the longer things go on, the likelihood of there being a conclusion is highly unlikely, isn't it? If it were possible that the work we've done here 
leads to a much more solid view of you. Would you think that that is a benefit to the community and yourself and your family at the end? Yes, I would. We all want to know what happened that night. We all want to know why. We all want to know who done it and, and for what reasons they did. But also, for the people that didn't do it, who, who had the fingers pointed at them, some of it ruined some people's lives. So it's also something for them as well as for, 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 for the family, isn't it? Blaenavon is a valley's town that owes its existence to the Industrial Revolution. At the time of the murders, it was still very much a tight-knit mining community. Dr. Nell Darby is keen to learn more about what it was like back in 1972 and how the town reacted to the murders. She's arranged to meet local historian John Evans. So John, you're a local historian based here in Blenavon. Could you give me a bit of kind of context about what the town was like in the early 1970s? There'd been coal mining for a very long time here, steel industry for a very long time. Blenavon was very much more a community in those days. People who worked underground had to look after each other, and they did. And of course the pub was kind of central to that sense of community as well, wasn't it? There were a lot more pubs in those days, with things like bank holidays, they'd be full, but Fridays and Saturdays wouldn't be able to get through the door. Isaac and Arthur, they spent so long in the local pub. Would that be seen as unusual? Was that kind of common? With blokes living like that by themselves, it would be nothing unusual for somebody to go into a pub when it opened and go home when it closed. If they had money in their pocket and they could afford it, they'd meet friends there, they'd make new friends there. It is quite striking how much of a community it feels like it was and is, and the fact that you know you can go out and talk to people and everyone seems to have known these two men or have come across them, and you, know, you were aware of both men as well, weren't you? My father was the secretary of the Mine Workers Lodge, that's the union, and he would go around and visit people who needed help. So I'd take him around in the car, so I got to meet Arthur. I didn't know him well, but I knew him. Presumably it was a, a huge story, both locally and nationally across Wales. Well, the town was full of policemen, and they would tend to come in shifts, and they'd be in plain clothes. But plain clothes meant the afternoon shift wore identical shirts and ties. The morning shift wore identical shirts and ties. So if three blokes you didn't know walked into a pub dressed in the same shirts and ties, you knew they were policemen. At the height of the investigation, detectives and police on the ground would total more than 100. Amongst them was former head of Gwent CID Mark Waters, who back in 1972 was a police sergeant. He meets up with Paul Bethel to recall his involvement in the case. Well, Mark, we're outside the old Blynavon County Police Station. In 1972, it was the first time I'd, I'd arrived here. I had a team of 10 men, uh, uniformed sergeants, and we were engaged in searches and, um, and house house inquiries. But this was where the incident room was, and it was a hive of activity. Mark would serve for over 40 years in the police, rising through the ranks to become head of Gwent CID. This has given him a unique insight into the investigation. The elder two brothers and the younger brother Ike had a small holding and Ike lived in a caravan on the site until moving in to his mother's house. Uh, mother lived at uh, Rifleman's Green, she passed away, so he lived alone in the mother's small house. But ownership of the house, Mark, that was between the, all the brothers? It would be between all the brothers. Yeah. And, that, uh, and Jack was the elder brother, uh, he was basically the boss and didn't like Arthur Waite, had no time for him. None of the three brothers ever married and made their living trading sheep at Abergavenny Market, which they attended together every week without fail. I did know Bert and Jack quite well. The older brother was quite a bit of a nuisance, very loud, and everything had to go his way. The other brother, Bert, was really non assuming man, very quiet. He would listen to the older brother and did what he was told. They didn't want Arthur Waite in the house. He was known as a sponger. He was known as somebody that was accepting drinks from Ike. 
and when he was going back to the house, he was probably eating his food. The other th thing they didn't like was the house itself was something of a shrine to the, to the mother. Ah, oh, right. And they felt that this man coming in there drunk was defacing their mother's home. So they had been roused before. Ike was warned, that man is not to come in this house. What do we know about Arthur then? Where was he from then, uh, Mark? He was a local man, ex-miner, lived in Blaraven, quite a heavy drinker. So why would he be stopping in Ike's then? Well, they'd become close friends, and I think it is probably the brother's suspicion was correct, that Ike was providing the money, and Arthur was quite happy to, 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 to drink it. And of course, the house is literally yards from the pub. It is. So yeah. it's ideal for the pair of them there. That's to correct. Stagger home and, yeah. and, and so Arthur would use the house as a, as yeah. a, that's, that's a right. drop-in off place for the night type of thing. Yes. Tuesday morning, the two brothers, Jack and Bert, always called for Ike. Seven o'clock, they'd be here picking up Ike to take him to market. They said that they called at the house on that Tuesday morning and that they didn't have a key, there was no answer. So the brothers didn't have a key then? Very unusual because it was their home, and Jack, the boss, would probably be in control of everything. Yeah. So they went to market on their own. So then we come to Wednesday, Jack and Bert apparently come back to the house and they can't get an answer, so they called the police. I went early that morning to Bristol to play rugby for the Gwen police. And whilst I was on the field, we had notification of an incident in Blaine Avon. It wasn't until we got back that I was informed that the bodies were in situ and couldn't be moved because I had to get there, because I was the local officer. I went into the house. There was no force entry. Isaac Hughes was prone on the floor on his back with his knees slightly up. He was in a stage of undress. Arthur Waite was sat in a chair, almost touching Ike Hughes with his feet. He was leaning to his left, with his left arm down over the chair. There was a, just a terrific amount of blood everywhere. It was such a ferocious attack that it was noticeable that on the ceiling, which had the polystyrene tiles on there, there were gouge marks where the assailant had actually hit the ceiling before hitting the head. Is there any suggestion or evidence that they'd been somewhere else in the house from the time they were brought in, about 11.15, 11.30? So there was evidence that the bed had been slept in. Arthur's shoes and socks were up in the bedroom, so he'd been up there. There was no sign of a struggle where in the bedroom. Violence had all taken place downstairs. So we think now that uh, about seven in the morning from the evidence of the pathology that they've come downstairs or one of them has come downstairs initially. We don't know if that's in response to somebody knocking the door or somebody letting themselves into the house. Yes, the door was locked when the young police officer arrived on the Wednesday, but there was blood from both Arthur and Ike on the light switch. So whoever left the property and switched the light off transferred blood from both bodies onto the light switch. And now, of course, 1972, that would be blood group in, wouldn't it? Of course, we didn't no DNA. no DNA in those days. The severity of the injuries on Arthur Waite's head, the seven or eight blows to the top of his head, right. uh, blood spurted everywhere. And the, Arthur's blood was found splattered across Ike. The only thing missing from that house was a cold chisel. Was that ever found, Mark? Never found. There was a hammer normally in the grate, which uh, they used because it was a coal fire, what you'd use to break up the coal. Um, it was a hammer blunt at one end and spiked on the other. That was gone, never seen again. In the back of the room was a settee, but it was immediately obvious that the cushions had been disturbed on the settee. They were upside down. And when we turned them over, the two cushions were absolutely saturated in Ike Hughes' blood and behind the sadi were a number of towels and they too were saturated with Ike Hughes' blood, which suggested that whoever had inflicted the injury on Ike Hughes tried to tend to his injuries. And the cushions, I believe, were put under his head and the towels were used to wipe 
the blood from his face and his head. Why did whoever's there look after Ike? Yeah, that, that seems to be the, the strange thing That's part right. about it, isn't it? Detectives were trying to find where the killer came from. In a modern police investigation, geographic profiling could help the detectives map the killer's movements. Jackie meets Samantha Lundrigan to find out more. The most interesting question for me, if I was coming in to profile this, would be, are we looking for someone in the local community, or is this someone who's come in from outside? So that would be the starting point for this type of crime. So Sam, we do know uh, with this case that there have been some potential suspects, two which were the brothers of one of the deceased, and also maybe somebody else living in the locality where there was a suggestion maybe of an affair with Arthur Waite. So under those contexts, how would you start to sort of unpick some of that? So I think there's three things, and this goes beyond geographic profiling. One is the opportunity. Did these individuals have the opportunity to commit this crime and that is where we look at the geography in terms of where they would be at yeah. what time can we place them in the locations but then we also need to start thinking in terms of do they have the means to do it and then lastly do they have the motive which is where the psychological profiling comes in so that's the fusing of geography and psychology where you can start to build up a picture in this particular case it seems to have been quite opportunistic. The murder weapon may well have come from the scene, so the means is really about getting to a location, but then how you carry out the crime. For the brothers, we can pretty much tick all of those, that they had the opportunity, that they had the means, and that they had potentially the motive. The motive because of this conflict yeah. between how they perceived Arthur Waite and that relationship with their brother. Yeah. Back in 1972, the police focused on more traditional ways of gathering information, including making thousands of door-to-door -door inquiries. As a police sergeant, Mark Waters oversaw the team who were charged with getting information from the townsfolk. With notices, as you know, things get found and things happen, and there's a mix-up on names or mix-up on dates, mix-up on relationships. And of course, you've got in these types of community, you've got this reluctance for people to t tell you exactly what's happened. They're afraid. Of, of being ostracised, I suppose, are they? It's very difficult. Paul has managed to track down some of the oldest residents of Blynavon who spoke to the police at the time, including Cecil Morgan. Do you drink in the Riflemans? Yeah. And would Arthur and Ike be in there when you were in there? More than likely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We all liked our pint of beer in, there, in yeah. those days. They're all big drinkers? All big drinkers. So what were you up to when the, when the murder happened then, Cecil? Were you about then? Do you remember hearing well, about it? Well, when they come around interviewing everybody in Blanau, when I was, I was having a bath, I just come home from work like. But you were spoken to by the police, were you? Yes, yeah, yeah. everybody did. Like what was the opinion in the pubs when, when the, after the murder, with the boys talking, was there any, any talk or gossip yeah. about it, Cecil? There was talk about this, uh, one or two chaps like I knew. You can't condemn anyone until you've got actual proof. That's the point. Well, it's a terrible thing, this double murder hanging over the, the village, I would imagine. Yeah. But would you like to see it resolved? I would. Some weeks prior to the murder, some people from London came to Blythaven into the pub on a very, very cold, windy night. And they had children with them. They were, shall we say, Irish travellers. And Ike, he was the kind of man who was so concerned that he allowed them to stay at his house for the night until they went back to London the following day. And everybody said, oh, they are the murderers. But we were able to disprove that. In fact, I went to London and together with other officers, we made inquiries and we were able to prove that they were in London at the time of the murders. Local resident Cecil has told Mark and Paul where to find Desmond Waite, a relative of Arthur Waite. Can he shed any light on the relationship between the murdered men? Arthur's father and my grandfather, two brothers. So he's a sort of second cousin to you then, is he? That's right, you've got it. Right. Yeah. What do you remember about that, the murders? Arthur, easy going. The easiest going man you could ever wish to meet. What, when it happened, I think it was Easter time. Yeah, Easter Monday. Easter Monday. Yeah. 
Of course, the riflemen's then was bloody packed. There were people coming down from London and all that. I would have made it worse. When they said it was done, I thought they were bound to catch that person. They got to catch that person. Arthur was in the way that night. He was there and he had to go. Mm. In the way of who? I don't know. This is the problem. This is it. Murders today, but they, they, there's always a first suspect. Yes. Isn't it? With this, it just, it just went on and on. But Arthur and Isaac were friends. That's right. How long have they been friends? Oh, a long time. And they were two different temperaments. But Arthur was very jolly. Like, he was a different person altogether. He wasn't liked. Did you hear any of the rumours yourself, Desmond? I heard them. Yeah, yeah, we hear them. Anything you can share with us? Well, one chap was mentioned. He, he was the most prominent one that they thought that had done it. Was there anything said about Jack and Bert at all? The two brothers? Yes. No, nothing mentioned nothing. about them. All their life was sheep. That's all they done was bloody sheep. Did Ralph have any girlfriends? No, no, he never bothered with women. Never bothered with it. Only, only him and... and, and, and Isaac? Uh, Isaac, that's right. That's only two was involved with it. Mm. Arthur ne never got married, never bothered with women at all. And I would... When you say they're always together, that's Ike and Ar Arthur were together, drinking together. That's right. What was the attraction, do you reckon? I haven't got a clue. I don't know why the two... Uh, Arthur was a different breed. Different cut of fish altogether than the, than the one you were. Back in 1972, the lives of the murdered men were reported heavily in the press. Dr. Nal Darby is examining newspapers from the time to see if the stories offer any clues as to why Arthur and Isaac may have been targeted in the attack. Isaac was 70 years old. He had developed this friendship with Arthur, who was 20 years his junior. It does appear to be a slightly unequal relationship between two men of quite different ages. You find in one of the press reports, there's a, a one word crosshead within the article that just says bachelor, which seems a bit odd to just slap bang in the middle of an article. But bachelor was quite commonly um, a euphemism at the time for being gay. So I do wonder whether there were rumors in town um, that reached the press about what the true nature of the relationship between the two men were. And that might support somebody coming across the men um, and becoming angry, discovering their relationship or finding it was different to what they expected. It feels like it's a local crime. It's uh, a result of some sort of spontaneous anger or fight between men who knew each other well. And I think the answers are still very much within the town. The Darkland team reconvene at the incident room to share the initial findings. So we've been out and about in the field now. Is there anything significant that's emerged so far? There was a suggestion that Arthur was having a relationship with various women. None of it, as far as I could see, was ever followed through in terms yeah. of, you know, the women would say no and that would be it. The relationship between Arthur and Ike. Was there any suggestion at the time that perhaps the relationship was a little bit more than just friendship? No, it's 72. Nobody mentioned that at all. That was never even discussed amongst the police officers. Now, interesting enough, the man we spoke to, who was a cousin of Arthur's, when I said to him, look, what was the relationship? And he said, I couldn't understand it. He said, because Ike was a very dark sort of fellow. He wasn't that popular. And we couldn't understand because Arthur was a very popular guy. And that's as far as he could go. There was certainly a great deal of resentment by the two brothers against Arthur Wynne. Oh yes, there was, yes. If you talk to people today, it's clear they still have very strong views on what might have happened and that those views are not the same. There's no consistency in terms of how the locals see this case and who they think was responsible. From a forensic point of view, of course, you've got the cushion being turned over. It's almost like a temporary act to conceal the blood. And of course, the towel's being hidden behind the sofa. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a haphazard sort of scene, if you like, and way of trying to conceal what went on. Because, you know, very shortly that was all going to be discovered. So that's all a little bit of a mystery. Why would somebody go to the bother, a stranger or a person who's going to do a hit on, bother to look after Isaac yeah. and wash his face, put him on a pillow? Yeah. It had to be somebody who had some sort of feeling for him. Paul, what would be really good is if we could try and find somebody with forensic expertise that could give us a little bit more background in relation to the blood at the scene and also the uh, marks on the ceiling. And let's just bring back any further information we've got before we make our conclusions. 
to examine the crime scene forensics of the case more closely, the team have drafted in the help of Joe Millington. Joe is one of the world's leading authorities on blood pattern analysis. The team have constructed a murder tent. This simulates the layout of the room where Arthur and Isaac were murdered. Can science take us any closer to figuring out what happened that fateful night? So here we are in a reconstruction of the scene in which the two men were killed. And today we're going to be looking at some blood experiments to try and reconstruct the patterns that were seen and try and understand the activities that took place here. They're in the house together. The information received at the time was that they were both in the bed. I came down the stairs and met their attacker or attackers in this room. The place clearly was covered in blood splatter. It looked as though somebody had tried to put Isaac on a pillow, washed his face, wiped the blood off him, trying to revive him. So how you're describing the scene, it helps me to put in my expectations of the types of bloodstains that would be available in this space. What we can tell from bloodstain patterns is that we can understand where blows were delivered and that helps us then to provide this essentially a narrative really yeah. about where people were at the moment that they were sustaining these injuries. I've seen the actual crime scene photograph. You know, there's something that sticks in your mind. Would it help, Joe, if I sat in the chair and we sort of made some sort of reconstruction? You yes, I think it would. Yeah, we, well, we've got Arthur sitting in the chair. He's sort of left in this position here with the head to the one side. So, Paul, from your memory of the photographs, tell us where the blood stains were in, in the vicinity of Arthur. Looking at it here now, the blood spatter was all along the, the foot of, of the fire grate and up the side and on, on the back end of it. So, based on your observations, Paul, yeah. then what we can do is we can start to build up our reconstruction. We've got an, a weapon that approximates to the coal pick that you say was missing from this scene. If I was to deliver blows in this area to your head, then there's a natural expectation that the blood droplets could be projected onto this wall. Okay, so we're going to start to build this scene up. I'm just going to put a small amount of blood on this paddle, and I'm just going to allow that to snap shut. We can see that there is almost like a void of stains in the centre there and then lots of stains that have been projected out towards the right and across onto that other wall there. So Mark, when you were talking about the fact that some of the spatter had landed onto Ike's body, then that's telling us that he must have been in that location in order to capture that spatter. So he was probably on the floor whilst Arthur was sustaining this attack. The blow then to Ike would have taken place before, presumably, the blow to Arthur, who was sat in the chair. Almost certainly. OK, so we've got the spatter on the wall, but now let's turn our attention to what the blood stains would look like that came from the hammer. Can I ask you, please, to just put this visor on just for yep. safety? So let's put a small amount of blood onto the end of this hammer. Let's see what happens when I swing this weapon. Yeah, it seems to match the crime scene photographs. So is, is it feasible then that he has attacked Arthur first? He's had a number of blows that perhaps have incapacitated him. Ike has intervened. He's been struck a blow, fallen on the floor. They've then continued to attack Arthur, and that's how the blood then has got on, onto Ike on the floor. That's definitely a possibility. If I had been the assailant delivering multiple blows with a weapon such as this, then there is quite a high expectation that I would have blood on me as the offender. And it seems to me that in the context of the case as it was investigated then, that the clothing of the brothers, as an example, wasn't subject to analysis to see if there was any blood stains on them. There was a problem because nobody had seen them on the Tuesday. They had enough time from Tuesday morning to go home get rid of those clothes, change, go to Abergavenny, come back, then go to the house on Wednesday. Those delays were damaging to the investigation. Having witnessed the experiment, Mark Waters outlines a possible theory with the team. Well, we start off with motive, if you like. The brothers were angry, like, because this man shouldn't have been in the house. 
Now was that a sexual relationship? We don't know. The brothers could have suspected and that would have set them off. So very religious, mother's house, here's this man, told not to be there, and there he's there. The only thing left in this house was a pick on the floor by the fireplace. We suspect that that was picked up and bang, they were going to finish him. And of course, if it was that scenario, they would have known what was there in the house. They were very familiar with it, and therefore that would have allowed them not to have uh, turned up at the address, tooled up as it were. What else could have happened there? Whoever came to that house, they didn't bring a weapon with them. Nothing was stolen. They come in there on seven o'clock in that morning, and they find him there again. And I think they were angry, very angry. So they needed to do something then to incapacitate him yeah. relatively quickly because he was this strong man that could have responded back yeah. and inflicted some damage on them, presumably. Supporting Mark Waters' theory is Derek O'Connell, who's always been convinced who the killers were. I suspected the brothers from the word go. I was so certain that the brothers were responsible that every year on the anniversary of the deaths, I visited them at their homes. And every time I said, you did it, now tell me why and how. And they denied it. So to sum it up, there's no doubt in your mind as to who was responsible for the murders? None whatsoever. It was them. Did they ever make a formal complaint against you? Never. That, that seems quite strange, doesn't it, for... Uh, you think the first thing they would have done is go to the police station if they were totally innocent and say, this officer is uh, constantly uh, accusing us. Had the roles been reversed, I certainly would have accused me of being harassing. Following the reinvestigation, two prime suspects have now emerged. Are the team confident they can present them to Gwent police? So Mark, if I can come to you on the basis now of everything that we've gathered and what's been shared, what's your conclusions in relation to this case? Well, my view is from motive, access, weapon, that this was a horrible domestic that went wrong. Those brothers went in there and found somebody that they really were happy with. The row broke out. They couldn't hit him. They couldn't beat him down with their fists. They picked up the nearest thing to them. I think this, as I said, was a domestic that went wrong. I'd like to understand a little bit more about how, with the timing, how they managed to get away from the scene. That muted press coverage might be an indication that there's a suspicion that it has got this domestic heart, which is not seen as, as newsworthy as kind of a, like a stranger murder or, or some other motive. So, Mark, given all that we've heard as the retired head of CID, what would you be recommending? now to the current head of CID in Gwent. There's a very, very good case against both of them. There's no one else outside this circle that fits in with the motive, what's at the house, that we know of. Derek O'Connell, as I said, went back every year and put it to the brothers. He was happy that they killed him. Tell me. He accuses them of the murder and not once did they ever make a complaint against him. So, Paul, I think given uh, what we've heard now, I think we can go back now to Gwent Police and present these two men uh, as very firm um, suspects to be uh, looked at. Indeed. <laughs>